So, um, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the big data lecture this term. And hi to the ones watching the recording on YouTube. Big data is all over the place. Uh, we often deal with big data sets when we do machine learning. So in this course, we will look a little bit into machine learning, but mainly into big data problems, how to store big data, how to process big data. However, there will be some links to machine learning as well, because in this class, I can simply put in some machine learning topics I'm unable to discuss in other courses. And the big data course is just a very you know, generic framework where we can discuss a lot of different things. Today, I will start with uh, the introduction, with the administration of this course, and we start with some of the content. And in the coming weeks, uh, we will look into parallelism, so how we can take advantage of modern uh, CPUs, GPUs to process large data sets efficiently. Uh, then we look into big data architectures, for them, we need uh, parallelism. And then uh, we will look into some problems that arise in big data sets. But sometimes a big data set not only means that you have a lot of examples, sometimes a big data set can be huge in terms of the volume, but maybe you just have a few samples in it and each sample is huge. So there are also then some small data problems. So I call that chapter big data, small data, all data. Um, then we'll look into uncertainty in learning. So when we learn, there's always some uncertainty. Also in big data, we'll see how to address this. And then when you put your machine learning systems in production in a real world use case, or not just an experimental use case, but a real world application that runs and serves customers, you need to think about machine learning operations, so about a production environment. Uh, then everyone is now so curious about all these transformer models which are trained on huge text data sets. So we look a little bit into them. And then there's a bit of an outlook towards quantum computing, uh, which is a completely different approach to process data. If you have taken my algorithms and data structures course, there was already an introduction and this introduction is a bit extended. And if you wanna take my quantum computing elective in the winter term, you're most welcome to do so. Um, and probably in the coming years, there will be more and more uh, quantum computing, and maybe that chapter keeps growing in the coming years. We will see that. So the motivation for this course is uh, the data sets around us, uh, they're growing very rapidly. If you just look back a couple of decades ago, uh, there were little digital storages, largely analog storages, and in terms of the volume, it was far less than what we're using today. Um, and the total amount of data around us is growing exponentially because all of us are using all these web services, we're using mobile devices, and a watch today is more powerful than a computer 70 years ago. And all of those devices generate uh, more and more data. So actually more powerful than a mainframe 70 years ago. Uh, so the amount of data is growing exponentially, so we need a lot of storage, and we also need to process the data eventually. So in the context of our department and degree program, we we're focused on AI, so there will be some links to AI and machine learning in this course, and we'll discuss how we can process big data efficiently. So what does big data actually mean? There are numerous definitions for example, Wikipedia says that big data is a field that treats ways to analyze, systematically extract, inform from, or otherwise deal with data sets that are too large or complex to be dealt with by traditional data processing application software. So we want to do something with the data, and it's just so much data or so complex, we cannot just use um, what we would usually use, maybe just a single computer or something, but we need to do something different. And in the context of big data, there you often see those three Vs, uh, which refer to this uh, domain. So one V stands for volume, which means we have a lot of data. Then the second V means variety, means not just the same data, but some diversity in the data. 
And the third V stands for velocity, which means it's probably not just static data, but data that has been collected over a longer period or time series data, something like this. Sometimes you see the four Vs with another V or something like this, but I think the three Vs is the most common one. So if someone ever asks you in the context of uh, big data, what is the three Vs, the domain we're dealing with, it's volume, variety, and velocity. And we need special means to deal with this data because uh, in a real world setting, it's far more complex than what you're just doing on your single laptop. And another question is, where does this term come from? For the last few years, maybe last 10 or 15 years, everyone keeps talking about big data. And it actually seems like this term came up in the 1990s uh, in a presentation, which was called big data dot, 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 and something. So this uh, presentation seems to be from 98 or something. And that's where the term big data was most likely coined. If you ever find an even earlier reference where this uh, term big data has come up, let us know and I'll be happy to update it. Uh, so it's actually nothing new, but I guess in the 1990s, big data meant something that is substantially smaller than big data nowadays. And we're in a setting like this. So the data keeps growing exponentially. Uh, and this plot was uh, published in 2018. And there was a prediction about how data would grow exponentially. And I think we're somewhere around like this now. So probably next year when I teach this course again, it's time for a new plot. Um, and we'll see um, what a projection will be. I think something around 2018, they didn't expect, and that's why I think it's it's even more data now is all uh, the consequences of COVID in 2020, that more and more people started to work at home, a major movement towards digitalization. So I guess we're a little bit above this now uh, because it couldn't be anticipated in 2018, but uh, it's clear for the coming decades, there will be um, a progression like this and data will still grow extremely rapidly because we're using more and more devices. Even nowadays, I don't know, just a rice cooker or whatever. There's all sorts of software and sensors in it. My wife just bought a super expensive rice cooker and uh, probably lots of high-end sensors and data analysis in them. So. Uh, and we're having more and more of these devices now, not just a phone or a computer. So it's very likely that this keeps growing exponentially. And um, now in the context of machine learning, I wanna discuss a setting that you have probably quite often come across. So most of the time you have worked in a setting where you had a sort of small data set, often just stored as CSV files, text files or something. And that's something you could store on your hard disk on your laptop. Small could even mean maybe a hundred gigs or a few hundred gigs, but you could still manage this on your laptop. When you load the data or a substantial part of it, it fits in your RAM. I don't know how much RAM does your computer have. So I hear 16, who has more than 16? How much do you have? Okay, 64. Yeah, I bought this MacBook here five years ago and most MacBooks nowadays still have 16, so somehow it's evolving very slowly. We also uh, got a comment in the chat. So one student says that he or she has 32 gigs. Um, and the data we work with, say to train a machine learning model is something we could process on our laptop. Maybe we use a GPU um, when we train those models. But in real world settings, where it's not just you, but you actually work in a big project or with huge data sets, it's far more complex because maybe your data set is just too large to be stored on your laptop. The data will not fit in your RAM and you need substantially more processing power, um, maybe a server, a cloud, whatever. And this is something you will probably come across in many industrial settings. And I think this is something you don't see that much in other courses. And that's why we will look a little bit at how to deal in, with such settings in this course. 
what I always do in my courses is I came across this document here. It's called uh, the Map of Computer Science. Uh, if you have taken a course with me before, you may have seen this. I think it provides a, the big picture of what computer science is about. And in each course, I sort of highlight what we are actually doing. Um, and then I try to zoom in now because these boxes are spread out. Zooming in doesn't help too much. Um, but just to give you a bit of an overview about what this course is about. Um, we will think about at the top right uh, about computer architecture because we need a different architecture to deal with such data sets. Uh, we also need to think about parallelism, scheduling, um, to deal with big data down here on the right. Uh, then we want to do machine learning and we're in the field of AI. Uh, we will see some links to natural language processors in processing, in particular, these transformer models that have become very popular in the last few years. Uh, and then we also look, look into quantum computing and a little bit into computer hardware. So actually what we're doing is quite spread out in this map. So zooming in doesn't work out too well. Uh, this course has various objectives. Uh, we will discuss uh, theory, but also applications. We will look into concrete data architectures, uh, frameworks, libraries, and tools. I want you to be able to apply that theory and transform it to real problems. And I want you to acquire transferable skills so you're in the future able to understand new methods that come up and how to use them. And we'll look into some current research problems around big data and think about where the field may go in the coming years. In order to succeed in this course, you need to have some background in machine learning. Otherwise, some of the chapters will probably not make much sense, but most of you are from the AI undergrad programs. Uh, so you will also have a background in algorithms and data structures. We need coding. I assume that you know the foundations of relational databases but that's one of the courses you have taken already. And obviously we need some maths to do all of this. But in any case, if you have questions, ask for help. Now, what I also always discuss in the beginning of my courses, and those of you who have taken my courses before know this setting, but we always have new students and exchange students. Uh, then uh, there's a workload for this course. Uh, concretely, uh, this course comes with 2.5 ECTS uh, because the big data course is a half module. Uh, the other half is uh, from Professor Val, who teaches uh, deep learning. So we're just doing the half module big data here. The whole module is five ECTS. Uh, then there are about seven weeks of lectures because we do lectures half of the term and the second half, there are seminar presentations. They will be on one Saturday. Maybe we also need a Sunday. We'll see how many students sign up eventually. Uh, the dates for the presentation are already in the iLearn course, so you can look them. I don't remember them by heart. So block them. We'll try to do all of this on the Saturday. Maybe we need a Sunday. We'll just see how many students uh, sign up with the presentation. And now um, one credit point, one ECTS is an average uh, 30 hours of workload during the term. So two and a half credit points. It's around 75 hours of expected workload for this course. That means we're just spending a minor time here in, uh, in the lectures and uh, you're spending far more time uh, on preparing for the course, preparing your presentations, doing revisions, further readings and not just sitting in class and coming uh, and listening to the others' presentations. So there's some workload, yes. But the lectures will be finished end of April? Or end of April? Yes, so the lectures are about half a term, and then you have time to prepare your seminar presentation. And that's why we're meeting then on a weekend uh, to do all the seminar presentations. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried in the past to do the seminar presentations during the term, but then you have little time to prepare. Um, and I want everyone to have the same time to be able to prepare because in the last setting, some students had two months more than others to prepare the presentation. I don't think that was so great. So we're just doing the presentations on a weekend. Um, and during uh, this uh, 
preparation for your seminar presentations. We don't meet here, but if you have questions, you just make an appointment with me and then we'll meet for the seminar presentations. Uh, there's the other half module of Professor Wahl, who teaches uh, deep learning. I don't know if you have met him already, maybe yesterday or something. Um, and the examination is your seminar presentation. So for the big data part, if you take also Professor Wahl's uh, half module, you will get a mark in his module and in mine, and then the average is your final mark. We have some exchange students who are only taking my part, so they only do my examination. Uh, and these uh, seminar presentations will be in groups of uh, three to four students, but we'll talk more about the seminar presentations and the marking uh, in a few weeks. Uh, this year in the seminar presentations, we will talk about machine learning design patterns. So if you take a, I don't know, a software engineering course, you learn design patterns like composite, strategy, factory. I guess you remember them, right? From or you've heard about them, design patterns and software engineering. Uh, this is like, you know, something that is well known, but there are also now uh, best practices for machine learning. And I came across this book two years ago. Uh, I think it's written by some Google uh, data engineers and they share some best practices about uh, how they do big data at Google. And they came up with some design patterns. And uh, we also have this book available through our library as an ebook. And I think there are like 30 design patterns in it, and those will be the seminar presentations. But I'll say more about this in a few weeks. Uh, though the schedule is, we'll finish the lecture part around end of April, early May. Then we will finalize your seminar topic, and then you work on the seminar presentations. If you have questions, I'm available via Zoom or in my office. And end of June, early July, so I put the exact date in iLearn, uh, we're doing the seminar presentations. And one thing is very important, the seminar presentations will only take place on campus. There are no exceptions. I've seen this uh, like two years ago, COVID was coming to an end. And I said, well, you can still present online if you have an excuse. And then suddenly, you know, the big data seminar killed 20 grandmas. So 20 students had to take the presentations online. So this year, I want your grandma to survive the big data seminar. So we're only meeting on campus. And I think your grandma will very much appreciate this. Um, yeah, it's always confusing if the grandma dies five times, you know. So uh, that's why only on-site. And I think the on-site setting is far better for discussions. Uh, so we'll only have the presentations on-site. Um, these presentations, how they work and how they get marked, I'll discuss this in a couple of weeks because that doesn't matter yet. Uh, but I mentioned Google and these uh, design patterns. Um, this year, we will also have a guest lecture online from a friend of mine who works at Google. Um, I worked with him like 12 years ago, and he rose through the ranks at Google and became one of the leaders of site reliability meaning they make sure the production environment runs reliably. He's one of the top people there, and he'll give a, um, a guest lecture online sometime in May. Um, so uh, you'll see some real big data use cases from him. But there's more details about when the lecture takes place. Um, I'll let you know. Um, this lecture is quite a collection of different uh, topics from various books. So there are a few recommendations here, books that could be helpful for further reading, but the course is just extremely diverse. So there are also sometimes footnotes or references to further readings. Um, but for deep learning, typically you need big data sets. And this is uh, now my favorite deep learning book uh, by Bishop and Bishop, uh, which just appeared end of last year. There's a good ML ops book, uh, a database internals book I find quite good, and the encyclopedia of big data technologies. But these are just recommendations for further reading. The course is quite self-contained, but sometimes there are some papers you should read until next time, and I will specifically mention this. Uh, here are the references. Uh, I recorded this course last year. And if you take a look at the recordings, you will see quite a lot has changed this year. So I used uh, the Christmas break to make some major changes to this course. Um, 
I've added a new chapter, which I call uncertainty in learning, because learning is very uncertain. And um, we want to be able to quantify the learning or assess how good a hypothesis is, and not just by, I don't know, calculating the R squared error or um, or, or some, some some other stuff, um, but um, there's some good methodology to assess uncertainty in models. We'll discuss this. So this is totally new this year. Uh, transformers are all over the place. So I have massively extended that chapter. I've extended the quantum computing chapter. And when I taught this course for the first time a few years ago, this was for students who did a fast track AI bachelors here, which we only offered once, and they didn't have a background in database fundamentals. So when I created this course four years ago for the first time, I discussed, or since then, I also discussed database fundamentals. But now we're running this regular program, and all of the regular students have definitely had an intro to databases. So I have removed that. Uh, if you have never come across databases, there will be some references for you to catch up. But I think we should just eliminate this revision of database fundamentals and focus more on transformers, quantum computing, and uncertainty in learning. Um, now, we are progressing with the motivation for this course, and there are various companies that have built completely new business models in the last few decades, like Uber, Airbnb, Netflix, Alibaba. And they all have something very strange in common. They don't have a lot of physical assets, at least Alibaba in the early days, which was more like eBay. Uh, so you have, or, but we can focus on Uber, Airbnb, Netflix. So Uber is the largest taxi company in the world, but they don't have a lot of taxis on their own. Airbnb is the largest hotel in the world, but they don't have rooms. And Netflix is the largest cinema in the world, yet they don't have actually um, physical assets, um, but they stream. So low physical assets, but extremely profitable and easily accessible. And what else do they do and which are they strong? Which What do they have in common aside from low physical assets and high impact when it comes to big data any ideas yeah okay there, there was are you yes <laughs> they don't have physical assets they have a lot of uh, digital assets like uh, everything of them is somewhere sort of about or yeah, like a digital form mm -hmm. yes yeah i want to say they have the longest most data yes so they are extremely data driven. And um, for example, if you look at Uber, they also offer really good services because they, based from past rides and demand, they predict how many taxis they would need in a certain part of a city at a certain time. Mm -hmm. So this reduces waiting times. They can predict your price, they give you a fixed price depending on um, local laws. And I think that's pretty cool, you know, and uh, they are doing a very good service. Same with Airbnb, uh, based on your preference and need, you get a customized price. Uh, Netflix, they are not just, you know, great that you, when you sign up, you click uh, three preferences and they make good recommendations, but based on user behavior, user preferences, they also made new movies and series, things that people may want to watch. And they're also heavily investing now in, in generative AI in order to automatically customize your movie. Uh, and this is all based on your data. So you're sharing data, but you also get something in return. Uh, and the worldwide economy is changing or has been changing enormously in terms of big data. If you look back like 2011, among the top 10 companies in terms of the worldwide market capitalization, only Apple and Microsoft were really data driven. And then just eight years later, uh, seven out of the top 10, and now probably it's at least seven or more that are heavily data driven, that are among the largest companies in the world. So market capitalization means the value of the stock. So uh, the price of a stock multiplied by the number of stocks. That's the market capitalization. 
And so we're seeing that it's not just affecting individual companies, but the worldwide economy as a whole. And that's your opportunity as an AI expert, because you can make a lot of money because they desperately need people to work on those kind of problems. And there are all these plots you find on the internet, uh, like an internet minute. So how much data is created uh, through the internet, like 190 million emails are sent per minute, 19 million text messages, almost 200,000 people tweeting. And now four years later, it's probably even more. And that data needs to be stored, processed, analyzed. So you need more than just, you know, be able to use scikit-learn on your local laptop, you need extra knowledge. And that's what this course is about. Uh, we also see that while in there's a big shift towards the cloud, uh, more and more data is stored and processed in the cloud. We'll also talk specifically about cloud when it comes to big data architectures in a couple of weeks, because the cloud has pros, but also various cons. We'll discuss this a little bit and see what the cloud is useful for and what the cloud is maybe not useful for. And we see that nowadays um, we generate massive data sets, not just in the US or Central Europe, but also in other parts of the world, in particular in China, a country that has invested enormously in AI and big data in the last 10 to 20 years. And I'll share you or share some of my insights in big data with you now, some of my personal um, experiences. Uh, so we had this CERN Spring Campus last week here. Was any one of you at the CERN Spring Campus? Okay. So this was the Spring School uh, by CERN experts. And uh, we had them come here because they do this once per year in one of the member states. And um, I worked at CERN. I left CERN 10 years ago. So that's why the CERN Spring Campus took here. So those who took the CERN Spring Campus last week, they have already learned about what CERN is about. Uh, but I'll say this now. So uh, CERN is the largest particle physics lab in the world. We have particles. So an atom is made of smaller particles, electrons, neutrons, uh, protons. And uh, they may consist of even smaller particles, so-called quarks. And how do you learn about them? Uh, for that, you need somehow you need to break and say a proton into smaller pieces. But how do you do this? If you want to, I don't know, smash a rock, you dump it on the floor and it maybe falls apart, but already breaking an atom into its particles is difficult. And then these particles into sub particles, you cannot just break them because there are heavy forces between them, but you can try to collide them and then they fall apart. And that's what a particle accelerator is about. You accelerate these particles like protons to nearly the speed of light, because if you speed them up, they have more energy, they also get heavier. And then ideally you wanna smash two protons and then they fall apart, they decay into their smaller particles. Now that sounds easy, but in fact, it's quite difficult because in such a particle accelerator, first of all, you have to accelerate those particles close to the speed of light. And then if you have, you know, one particle in the one direction and the other one in the opposite direction, you somehow want them to collide. And that's also not that easy. When I worked at CERN, I was told uh, the proportions can be compared to the following. Imagine you have a needle in Europe and a needle in the US and you shoot the needles above the Atlantic Ocean and you want two needles to collide. And in terms of the proportions, that's comparable to colliding to protons. So that doesn't work out very well with single protons, but you just have a bunch of a lot of protons and then you let these bunches intersect and you hope um, there are some collisions. Uh, this is what the Large Hadron Collider is about. The Large Hadron Collider is a circular particle accelerator. Uh, CERN is based at the border between or on the border of, Ch of Switzerland and France in the Geneva 
region, the accelerator is underground, about 100 meters underground, and it has a circular shape, and the circumference is around 27 kilometers. Why is it that large? Because then you can accelerate even better. CERN started initially with very small particle accelerators. You can also see this around here. And they were used for experiments in the past. Nowadays, they're not needed anymore for experiments. They're just used for pre-acceleration. Uh, and the rule is the smaller the particles you want to investigate, the larger or the more energy you need, and then typically the larger your experiment would be. And eventually the Large Hadron Collider is nothing else but a very large microscope. So you use a microscope in, in school and in biology to learn about cells. And then if you want to see what's smaller than cells, you need a much bigger microscope. Uh, and here, if you want to look at subatomic particles, you need an ever larger microscope. And this is what the accelerator is about, to accelerate. And then you have these four detectors, which are CMS, Atlas, LHCB, and ELIS. Those are big installations underground in which you collide and then they measure the decay. And then, now we're coming to the big data part. They are collecting massive amounts of data, and those data sets uh, need to be analyzed in order to determine which subatomic particles exist. And around 11 or 12 years ago, the Higgs boson was confirmed that it exists, uh, which was the last quark uh, left from theory that, has, that had not been found yet in an experimental setting, and that was confirmed yeah, around 11, 12 years ago. Uh, now, this is a big data problem because you have these detectors and they generate a massive amount of data. So when I worked there 10 years ago, it was something like that they, or I want to make any guess, or you want to make any guess, not the ones who took the CERN Spring Campus, but say you run this machine and you do all these collisions in the four detectors, how much data does that generate per second? Yes? Okay. It was in fact 10 years ago around one petabyte per second. So a thousand uh, terabytes, um, enormous, you know. Uh, you're unable to store that data. And nowadays it's even more uh, data because they've um, enhance the experiments. So uh, those of you who took their CERN Spring Campus last week, you may have seen that they talked about all these triggers and pre-processing that they partially use GPUs. Anyone remembers this from last week who was there? Yeah, because uh, Derek uh, talked about that. So you need to do heavy pre-selection of the data and then only store the most relevant data for further processing. When I worked at CERN, the data center there could store in total about 100 petabytes. But since these experiments have been running and they've been more complex now, they've also built new data centers. Eventually, it's a huge amount of data to be stored and to be analyzed. And CERN is probably one of the prime examples for that. Uh, you're probably wondering what is all of that useful for? It's fundamental research. Applications are not the center of CERN, yet uh, there are numerous applications that we're using every day now, like in medicine, in radiology, and all of you are using the World Wide Web, which actually came from CERN. The internet came from the US military, but there were different protocols. It was difficult to exchange data was even difficult to exchange data within CERN among the different research groups. And then they had collaborations with other institutions around the world. And then uh, Tim Berners-Lee, he actually came up with the World Wide Web proposal to define a standard of how to exchange data within CERN and the particle physics community around the world. And within a couple of years, it's been deployed all over the world. So it was just a helper for CERN, in fact, to exchange data among the research groups. And now all of us are using the World Wide Web. Uh, so this is about CERN. And I also want to share a big data use case with you. So I worked at CERN on um, mainly on search engines, because CERN also has a lot. So I didn't work on the accelerator, but CERN has 
millions and millions of documents and they need search engines to uh, go through these documents, index them, find some interesting information, which was part of a larger document management system, uh, which needs to uh, collect the data and store it and process it. And I worked in that team, but I mainly worked on the search engine for all the documents at CERN. Uh, then there's another use case I worked on. It's about detecting electricity theft. So electricity theft is a huge issue all around the world, but it's in particular an issue in emerging markets. And what people do is they tamper meters, they tamper with other infrastructure like transformers. Uh, they may bypass metering equipment. They could arrange invoicing problems, whatever. So the goal is always getting electricity without having it recorded by infrastructure. If you just plug in your computer at your neighbor's power outlet, that's not considered theft in terms of the utility because it's just charged to your neighbor then. It may still be theft between the neighbor and you, but the utility doesn't care because it's finally recorded that someone consumed it. So we care about it that it's not recorded by the infrastructure. And uh, there are many instances how you can do electricity theft. It's a big issue. It's a loss of revenue and profit also leads to an unstable and unreliable power grid. And there are various studies for emerging markets, countries like India, Pakistan, Nigeria, and they say it's up to 40% of the total electricity distributed there that disappears through fraud. Now that's a big problem. And eventually this loss of revenue gets charged to all the honest customers. But if you have people manipulating power infrastructure like this, it also leads to major issues in power supply and reliability of your crit. In Germany, it was always assumed that this was around 1% of the electricity distributed. But utilities told me during COVID that this went up to something like 2% or something like that. So um, it's growing or was growing, but still we're far away from the 40%. And if you stack up all the fraud around the world. Yes, you raised your hand. The reason why in Germany it was brought like this was due to the missing control units for the solar energy. And if you started uh, uh, putting in your solar energy without announcing it to your uh, network distributor, mm -hmm. uh, the clock was turning backwards. Yeah. And so you didn't have to pay as much uh, as you get. That's uh, one reason, yes. But you can also try to halt the clock on, on one of the old meters, which is actually very simple, but I will not give the advice here. How to do it. Uh, yeah, and if, if you stack up the fraud around the world, so these numbers were just before COVID. I don't have up-to-date numbers for after COVID. This was believed to be around 100 billion US dollars per year. So that's a huge amount. Um, 100 billion, it's just very hard to quantify what it gets you. So I always try to highlight what it gets you. And you could, for example, buy around 20 aircraft carriers, um, which is enormous because the US uh, Navy has 11 or so, something like this. So 20 aircraft carriers is a lot. Now we want to detect uh, the fraud. And uh, this was actually my PhD project a few years ago. Uh, we got data from electricity from an electricity provider utility in Brazil. We had 3.6 million meters. A meter was called a customer. And there were monthly meter readings. So this was before uh, the smart meters got deployed uh, to a large scale. And we had about 200 million meter readings per month or, or in total. So these were monthly meter readings. You now take a smart crit and you have a reading every 15 minutes, obviously you have far more, but this was the data we had at that time. And then some customers got inspected and in total over the years, 800,000 inspections were carried out. 
uh, which is enormous because you send two technicians to a house checking if the meter or other infrastructure got manipulated. And this 800,000 times, the utility assumed that it cost them an average 100 US dollars to carry out an inspection. So just getting these inspections cost them 80 million US dollars. It was a lot of fun for me to work on this data during my PhD time because <laughs> such data sets are not publicly available. If you find publicly available data sets about electricity theft, it's just minor synthetic data sets, usually nothing real to a large scale. And I could work on that data set that cost 80 million to collect. That was quite cool. And uh, big data in terms of that time, I mean, it's still a big data set. But now with smart meters, we would have obviously have far more meter readings because you would have a meter reading automatically every 15 minutes. So it would be far more than here. And I built a machine learning system that detects the fraud quite adequately from that sample of customers that got inspected. And we could then suggest or predict which customers should be inspected most likely. Uh, that's what I worked on. And... Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sharing the advice of how to steal electricity easily. Uh, I was sort of, you know, funny. I was during my PhD time, I, I traveled to many conferences and gave workshops because uh, in this whole field of power supply, AI was something new to them. So I gave also workshops at conferences to help power engineers to learn about AI. And once in a workshop, there was a guy from some emerging market. And he shared a lot of advice of how he actually stole electricity back at home. <laughs> so and that was not really the goal of my workshop at that time. Um, and I kept making the joke, you know, I, I always kept saying um, that I wanted to make a career in industry or become a professor after I finished my PhD. But I said, if I didn't find a great job, I would maybe just help people to steal without getting caught because one could also build an AI that may steal adequately. It's obviously a joke because I have to say this because it gets recorded and appears on YouTube. Um, yeah. Or once I was at a conference in, in Singapore, you know, and, and I gave a speech there and then somehow I was just talking too much and then I shared some ways how you could actually manipulate your meter and then I felt oh you know Singapore they have all these terrible punishments you get caned you know so I felt uh, then I said well this is just what others do I'm not sharing any kind of advice because <laughs> Singapore is brutal you know you get you know major punishments for minor offenses so I had to highlight this at a conference because people get caned all the time for whatever. Um, yeah, so these are some of the big data use cases I have worked on, obviously many more. I just wanted to share two big data settings with you. And uh, this was the introduction. And I wanna know from you if you have any questions about uh, this introduction or the organization of the course or what we will be doing in the coming weeks, if there's any anything you would like to know. Also checking our chat. Just have a few students in the online session. Most are here on site, which is good. So I guess there are no questions and we can uh, already look a little bit into the next chapter. Uh, so what I said is we, we want to process big data sets. And for that, we need, in order to work with big data sets, process them in architectures, we need to know about databases. But this is what I'm assuming this year, that all of you have some background in relational databases. When we go into chapter three, I would just say two or three slides about relational databases so that we're all just on the same page, but there's no proper revision. And just having a big database is not enough because if we just use one core in our CPU to process all of this, we will never finish. And that's why we need to think about parallelism. And I know there's a little bit of parallelism discussed maybe in your operating systems class, but not that much, right? Um, when I, in the past, I taught a programming two lecture 
And in that, I discussed a lot of parallelism, but I felt most of my colleagues did not. So when I then started teaching this course, the big data course, and I didn't teach the programming too anymore, I felt I should move just this parallelism uh, content to this course. Um, and just we're just making sure that all of us are on the same page when it comes to parallelism. Who of you feels that you have some, that so far you have had some good exposure to parallelism and multi-threading? Okay, what have you done, for example? Okay, good. But for most of you, you, you've also raised your hand, or? Yeah, uh, also like for in the technical um, semester, um, uh, I worked a lot with big data, and therefore parallelism is a must, especially with depending on you and mm -hmm. server and. Yeah, good, because we will also talk about GPUs and all of this in chapter three, but we will start with the foundations of parallelism now, and uh, we still got a few minutes to start with this. Uh, we will look into two terms that are often used as synonyms that are confused, parallelism and concurrency. We'll discuss them in a moment. Uh, then we'll see how to create threats and processes. And then it's interesting, if you know how to create a new thread, it doesn't work very well in Python. For those who have done big data or have you come across this, the global interpreter lock? Yes, but uh, only passively because most of the parallel, um, yeah, it used CUDA uh, mm -hmm. and also um, I had, didn't have to deal with it as much, but I came across it. Yeah, so the global interpreter lock is some limitation in Python. There are some ways around it, but there are also some good reasons why it exists. Uh, now with the latest version, Python 3.13, they are slowly starting to abandon it. I saw that you agreed. Is that what you wanted to say? Um, and maybe you had a look, I just updated the slides yesterday because a few days ago, I found out about this uh, change in 3.13 and then I added a few slides, but it's not gone yet. It's slowly um, being faded, so it's still relevant. And then uh, what I also like in, in, in my uh, chapters that I also share some best practices about how all of this works and what I've experienced in the last few years when doing that kind of work. Now, there are four terms that you may have heard in your operating system course, and we're wondering how they are actually related. What's the, what's the difference between a process and a threat? Anyone? wants to say this, yeah. Processes are physically separate. They have a different PID. Um, and threats are basically um, small units inside of a single process. And the major difference is sharing uh, memory space, which processes don't. They have a unique space yeah. uh, for memory and threats share the same uh, memory space with them. Yeah, that sounds good. So I have a process and in that process, I may have one threat or multiple threats. And within uh, that process, these threats share the memory of that process. But if I have multiple processes, they use separate memory in the RAM because the operating system separates them. Both are a way towards parallelization uh, because say if I have a process and two threats, I could ideally run these two threads each on a core. So this would run in parallel, but there are various limitations and issues because these uh, threads in the same process, they share memory and this can lead to all sorts of problems. That's why there are typically some locks or other constraints. Um, I could also just fire up multiple processes and they run separately, but creating a process is more heavy than creating a threat. Uh, so there's some good reasons. And, and then once you have processes, actually uh, that you have processes in sharing data, it gets more complex. You can do it, but they need to communicate, but they don't have the same uh, frame in the RAM that they can share. So there are pros and cons uh, for, bo for both of this. Uh, there, there was an attempt how to define these terms in a Stack Overflow article, but there are actually two 
um, more interesting terms uh, that are often confused, concurrency and parallelism. Anyone has an idea of how they could be distinguished? Because a lot of people use them as synonyms. So I guess you have a suggestion. Well, the way I use parallelism and concurrency is that you have tasks that can be done in parallel. For example, if you have two people and you have two, two tasks, you can give those two tasks to those two people and both of them ideally will be doing them simultaneously and in parallel. And concurrency is then something that is a little bit harder to explain because concurrency is a um, it's a way of um, making it look like it look it runs in parallel because um, by nowadays the computers are so fast that you can, for example, do one part of the task wait a little bit and do a second part of the task and it shows context switches are mm -hmm. going to be so fast that for a human it will look like they work in parallel okay yeah so because this is also recording but the mic is too far away from you so parallelism you said uh, like you have two people doing something differently and in parallel means you have two cores or two cpus where this is done at the same time and concurrency, for example, how I see it is, say you have one core and you run one thread and then one thread or one process, then one process, so they can share time. Um, but uh, real parallelism would be that two things are really running at the same time and not slicing the time. Uh, I also saw another hand raised. I don't know if, if you want to share. Yeah, so what you say is concurrency, one task has to wait and a different one can run. And there are many reasons for waiting. As I said, some people use these as synonyms, unfortunately. I don't think they are really synonyms. And there was a good attempt on Stack Overflow about how to define them, which is quite close to what we have done with maybe some more details. Feel free uh, to read this. But again, some people define this differently. Um, now I want to know from you, uh, not as a coder, but as an end user, how would you deal with, for example, multi-threading? So you have a process with multiple threads. How do you deal with this as an end user? Or, or do you have an instance where you come across multi-threading as a user? Yes? I do whenever you can buy. You usually do it in a multi-threaded uh, setup because then the UI is still responsive even though you have something running in the background. Yes, user interfaces is a great example. So you have a long calculation, for example, in Excel. You don't want Excel to freeze. You still want to be able to use it. So uh, there is a thread for your UI and the thread for the actual computation. You also have your hand raised. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the example that you said is, I'm repeating it because it's not being recorded in a game. You have a one thread for the environment, one thread maybe for the AI. Yes, that's also an example. And all of us are using multi-threading all the time. Otherwise, stuff would just be freezing uh, and we don't want UIs to freeze. But aside from user interfaces, there are obviously many other good applications for multi-threading. Uh, yes? Coping files. Coping files, yes, because you don't want the whole operating system to be on hold, but you, you want to have this run in the back. Yeah, those are good examples. And uh, before, so I think we're done for today uh, because now there will be a larger code example and we'll discuss this uh, next week. And I'll see you next week then.